This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Today I'm going to be going solo. I'm going to walk through a recent interview that MMT godfather Warren Mosler did with Joe Weisenthal and co-host at uh, the Odd Lots Podcast, as they call it. But before we dive into that, let me bring to your attention, we are promoting now our conference, the Mises Institute. It's going to be held on November 9th, and the title is Elections in the Economy. Do they really matter? And it's going to be in Fort Myers, Florida. It's going to be speakers of Tom DiLorenzo, Mark Thornton, and Murray Sabrin. They're going to challenge prevailing economic myths and take a critical look at the U.S. political theater, offering insights into how political interventions distort our economy. It's an opportunity to move beyond partisan rhetoric and examine the way the government affects our lives and livelihoods. So again, that's going to be November 9th, Fort Myers, Florida. If you want to get your tickets, go to Mises.org slash Fort Myers 24, and that's F-T-M-Y-E-R-S 24. So again, Mises.org slash F-T-Myers 24 to see the information on how you can get tickets to the upcoming conference. Okay, so for our discussion today, as I say, I'm going to just go through Warren Mosler, in case you don't know, is, they, they call him in this interview, the godfather of MMT. I debated him at Columbia years ago at this point as sort of an Austrian versus MMT, MMT being modern monetary theory uh, debate. It's got an inordinate number of views on YouTube. And uh, let me just say, Warren is a very charming fellow. Like, in fact, at that debate, when we were talking beforehand, I almost had to consciously step away from him so that he wouldn't butter me up too much. I mean, he designs race cars. He's just an interesting larger than life character. And that comes across in this odd lots interview that, you know, of course we'll link to it here. If you want to go listen to the whole thing, I'm just going to play a few excerpts for you in this episode here of the human action podcast. So by all means, go ahead and listen to it. Um, it's unfortunately, I just think he's wrong or at least, the policy prescriptions that many people derive from his framework, I think, are very uh, harmful to the economy. Okay, so there are certain ways that the MMT approach, you could say, okay, well, given the way they define things and blah, 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 okay, maybe that's true as sort of a tautology. But my overarching point, and I've been saying this repeatedly over the years, is that what the MMT framework leads you to conclude is very wrong. And then we're just arguing about, okay, but is the MMT framework really wrong or is it just misleading? You know, okay, we can have that discussion if you want. But the big takeaway is MMT in practice is leading many progressive leftists to think, oh, we found the solution. We can fund all of our programs and the right wingers can no longer say to us, well, how are we going to pay for that? Yeah, single payer healthcare would be nice. How are we going to pay for it? And then they're going to say, the Green New Deal. Yeah, that's that's good in principle, but it's too expensive. And for a lot of people on the left, the MMTers in their mind have convincingly demonstrated that that's you know, silly talk. That's only applicable for the household or even the giant corporation. But when it comes to sovereign governments that issue currencies that are fiat and that moreover have deep debt markets denominated in their own currency so they can borrow freely against it and so forth. For those people, what's what's the issue? There's never going to be a situation where the U.S. government can't come up with U.S. dollars to pay bondholders because they can just create more U.S. dollars, right? That's the insight of, of MMT. So for this particular episode, I'm not going to give a comprehensive critique of the MMT framework. What I will do is I'll link. There, there was recently a documentary that came out that starred Stephanie Kelton, so we'll link to that if you want to, if you missed that, you want to go see that. Um, just jot a note to myself here. But here, again, it's what Moser's talking about with the folks over at the Odd Lots podcast is, is part of MMT, but it's a specific claim having to do with um, the idea. So the, the conventional wisdom is that what, since the Federal Reserve raised rates, fairly aggressively when price inflation was getting out of hand, you know, after the lockdowns and so forth. And 
the different schools, you know, the Keynesians were worried about, uh oh, you might tip the economy into recession if you raise rates too much. Let's tolerate, let's err on the side of, you know, overheating versus slamming the brakes too hard. And the hawks, you know, the hard money types, but even some of the Keynesians who were on the more hawkish side were saying, no, 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 we don't want to let, you know, once we let the inflation genie out of the bottle, it's going to be hard to put it back in. It's going to be like the late 70s, early 80s. We don't want to have to do that again. So let's nip this in the bud. Let's err on the side of aggressive hikes. And if that you know starts making unemployment shoot up too much, then you know we can deal with that later. And the MMTers though are saying, no, you guys got things backwards. It's not just that you're a little bit wrong around the margins. You totally got this backwards. That raising interest rates when there's a lot of debt in the economy, or at least you know government debt, means that now the government is paying more to bondholders. And so other things equal, raising interest rates, given. The other facts of our economic and financial situation means that the federal government is pumping hundreds of billions of dollars more per year into the hands of the private sector than they otherwise would have. And so we shouldn't be surprised, the MMT people say, that jacking up interest rates aggressively didn't tip the economy into recession in like 2023, even though a lot of people were predicting that. And we also shouldn't be surprised that price inflation is still a thing. Right, that, that geez, how can we have it nipped that in the bud? Why do we still have this persistent price inflation, even though the Fed's been hiking aggressively? And again, the MMT people are saying because you're missing the point where the government and you know, so the, the MMT people view the central bank and the federal government as like a unified entity, and so they're saying that entity, when interest rates rise, when there's outstanding trillions and trillions of dollars of federal debt, that's just an extra, you know, now the channel of money income flowing into the hands of the private sector is that much higher. So of course, that's going to boost demand. That's going to prop up employment or keep unemployment down. And it's going to keep pressure on price, the price level, right? So that's where they're coming from. So um, I, I largely disagree with that, but let's just go through and again, we'll play some clips here from Mosler's recent discussion, and then I'll just give sort of my feedback on them from an Austrian perspective. Okay, so this first clip, Moser's just getting warmed up, and he's actually doing the mirror image of the accounting on this. So he's talking about when QE, you know, right after, remember, the, the financial crisis in the fall of 2008, and the Federal Reserve announced QE, which stands for quantitative easing. And there, the idea was they had already dropped rates to basically zero, meaning, you know, short-term rates, the federal funds rate in particular the so-called target rate that the Fed directly controls right now in this regime. And that oh, that didn't work. Economy's still on the ropes. And so the Fed at that point under Ben Bernanke said, okay, we're going to engage in quantitative easing or QE. And so there the idea is they started telling the market, this is how much we're going to spend buying assets and adding to our balance sheet. Right. So normally the Fed, before the 2008 crisis, the Fed didn't talk like that. They would just announce their policy in terms of the you know their interest rate targets now buying and selling assets w was always happening behind the scenes right like if the fed wanted to lower interest rates typically the way they would do that is they'd go buy assets and then in the process of doing that they're adding reserves to the system and then since the federal funds rate is just the interest rate on overnight loans of reserves that you know banks make to each other therefore pumping in more reserves, other things equal, tends to lower the federal funds rate. And then likewise, if the Fed wanted to hike, they would sell off assets that would drain reserves from the system. So on the margin, again, other things equal, the equilibrium price you have to pay to borrow those reserves, which are now scarcer, goes up. Okay, But again, the Fed typically before 2008 didn't announce to the markets, oh, we're going to buy this much in terms of treasuries over the next six months. or what? No, they just said, this are interest rate targets. And, you know, you can figure out how we do that if you want to go take an economics class. Okay. So that's, I think, partly why they called it quantitative easing is they were, th there were different reasons and I've seen different explanations given, but I think part of it is it's, it's telling people, you know, this is the quantity of reserve or assets now that we're going to go purchase as part of this alleged monetary stimulus. Okay. So here, Mosler is is making the opposite case, saying when everybody else was was saying QE was going to be stimulative, 
because um, it went hand in hand with lowering interest rates. He he was saying that no, I, I was saying this isn't going to do it stimulate anything because you're lowering interest rates. Something interesting happened this cycle compared to prior cycles. Now, in prior cycles, like in 2008, I was saying back then that the um, rate cuts, the Bernanke rate cuts, were probably not going to do much for the economy, if anything, because cutting the rates from five and a half to zero or whatever it was at the time removed something like $400 billion a year of interest income from the economy. It lowered the deficit by $400 billion from what it otherwise would have been. And all that income and those net financial assets were no longer being added. So I was looking at a very sluggish recovery. Uh, I, I didn't see the stimulus packages being large enough to cause a particular boom. It was, it was plenty large enough for you know decent growth, but not not any kind of a runaway inflationary boom or anything like that. Okay, so again, I'm just not going to dwell too much on that. I'm just showing you like w- the logic of what he's saying. So now, if that was the case back when QE first was launched, now we're doing the opposite on the other end of the spectrum when the Fed is tightening and it's letting its, uh, I don't remember them in this, in the podcast episode of the odd lots getting into this, but just so you know, the, the Fed's balance sheet has been steadily dropping for a while now. Um, and so it, the, the hikes in interest rates are going hand in hand with the Fed actually, you know, letting assets roll off of its balance sheet. So, so that, that is going on. And so now, again, the flip side, the the MMT camp is saying that it's it's the opposite that uh, raising interest rates is stimulating the economy, whereas both the Austrians and the Keynesians think it, that it's contractionary. All right, so we'll go ahead and, and play that. And notice that the the debt plays a factor in this. Okay, so I'll play that clip and then I'll elaborate a bit on it. So mm-hmm. let's bring it to now. But back then, here's the point. Back okay. then, the debt to GDP held by the public was something like 30 or 35%. So a 1% rate hike, or in those cases, rate cut, but a 1% change in rates, a rate hike would have added maybe 35 basis points of income to the, you know, percent of GDP to the economy because the debt to GDP was like 30 or 35%. This time around, it's 100% roughly. You know, debt to GDP held by the public. Yeah. So a one percent increase in rates two and a half years ago ultimately increased interest payments by a full one percent of GDP. Okay. So again, just to make sure you understand the logic of Mosler's argument, he's saying, you know, at a time when the the federal debt is a share of the economy was relatively small, this effect wouldn't matter. Okay. Um but it's as the debt gets bigger and bigger, that's when it really does matter. As he says in the interview, Paul Krugman, using his new Keynesian modeling approach, and by the way, it just shows Mosler is a sharp guy. Okay, so he is correct that, you know, in terms of academic economists, how would you classify Paul Krugman's framework? He would be a new Keynesian. Okay, and what does the new mean? It has to do with, um, like, so there was like old school hydraulic Keynesianism in the 50s and 60s that kind of just mechanically thought that, oh, yeah, the government runs a budget deficit and then that's going to boost employment, but it might fuel price inflation and da, da, da. But then there was the rational expectations revolution in the 70s with the guys like Robert Lucas and you know Milton Friedman was involved with all that stuff, too. And they're, you know, they were just bringing in insights about, hey – if the people in the market are expecting inflation to come, they build that into, you know, their, their wage demands, if it's workers or whatever, and uh, it can offset the ostensible benefits of a, you know, of a loose monetary policy. Like once expectations build in all that stuff, you, you don't get as much bang for your buck, literally. Okay. And that's why the Phillips curve moves around as one way of describing what's going on. Okay. So the new Keynesian models are um, are not susceptible to that critique. So the new Keynesian models are still trying to show that, oh, yes, the government fiscal policy can affect the economy. You know, there's a role for the government or there's a role for the central bank and the government to use monetary and fiscal policy, depending on the circumstances, to help the economy get out of a recession, even if 
in the model, all the agents are rational and, you know, they understand the structure of the reality and that kind of stuff, right? It, it doesn't rely on widespread money illusion, for example, which was true of the old school Keynesian models of the 50s and 60s, okay? So Mosler is right that Paul Krugman is a new Keynesian. And what Mosler is saying is when Krugman was arguing with Stephanie Kelton a while ago, and by the way, just note that, these guys are not all on the same team. I mean, they all wanted to base the dollar. Don't get me wrong. They're certainly not gold bugs. But my point is that Krugman was having turf battles with Kelton, possibly, you know, just out of ego. You know what I mean? Like he used to be the big dog, and then now there's these up and comers that are displacing him, and and so forth. You know, could be could be some of that involved too. But my point is that as a new Keynesian economist, Krugman was pushing back against the MMTers like during the Obama years. And one of the things Krugman did admit was he said that, it, you know, yeah, yeah the re like part of how Krugman said deficits eventually do matter, even though he agreed, you know, during Obama's first term, we didn't need to be worrying about deficits at that point, even though the Republicans and, you know, guys like Ron Paul always hammer home about, oh, we're drowning our kids in debt. We don't need to worry about that right now, Krugman said. But he was saying where the MMT or people go wrong is they they never worry about it. You know, they just think it's a matter of price inflation is the only issue. And then Krugman was saying, no, the absolute level of government debt relative to GDP does matter. And, he, and Moser is recounting because Krugman had agreed if the government debt gets too big, then if price inflation gets higher than the Fed wants it to be, now the Fed can't just raise rates to deal with that which you know normally would be the, the the normal fed response like oh if 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 cpi is rising too rapidly the fed can just hike rates and uh you know squ uh just tamp down demand and get cpi growth back into the desired range but krugman was admitting that well no you can't let the deficit or the debt get too big because then in that scenario the very act of raising rates means that on net all this extra income is flowing into the hands of the bondholders, thus propping up aggregate demand. And therefore, you know, you're, you've painted yourself into a corner. You, you can't get out that, um, the normal fed response to lower inflation would itself fuel inf inflation. Right. So Bosler is, is saying here that, Hey, I'm not, this isn't some wacky MMT view I'm even Paul Krugman agrees with me in principle. And so we just kind of disagree about the numbers. Like, like when is this effect a big deal or not? Like Krugman didn't think that was going to be a big deal as of like 2010, whereas Moser at that point did think it. And, and so Moser's point is, you know, now the debt's a lot bigger than it was back then. And so clearly this is an issue. Okay. Let me play one more clip here before I sort of, go off more on what I think is wrong with this approach. So here, Moser is going to explain why, in one sense, it's just an accounting offset, but then the role of the federal government makes their, you know, a net increase if the size of the debt is big enough. And I got in that meeting because in my car company, two of the people on the board of directors were ex-engineers, one General Motors, one Ford. They knew Card personally. He was an engineer at GM. And when I talked to him about the interest income thing, the same way I'm talking about it to you, they said, you got to talk to Andy and set up this meeting. You know, I went to the White House. The meeting was in the West Wing. And the first thing I did was just what I said to you and what, it, look, in the economy itself, when, when they lowered interest rates, okay, it helped borrowers, but it hurt savers, you know, into the penny. For every dollar saved, there's a dollar borrowed in the economy. Banks have loans and deposits, and they're equal, or somebody made an arithmetic mistake, you know, assets and liabilities. And so, you know, when you lower rates, you're just shifting income from one entity to another. And the only way that can have an effect is if, if there are differences in the propensities to spend interest income of those two. But at the macro level, because of the public debt, when you lower rates, you're cutting the size of the deficit, you're cutting total interest income in the economy. I said, I think that effect dominates. And looking at what happened in the last year in 2002, I, you know, I wouldn't expect rates to do anything. And Card looks at it and he goes, he says, yeah, why would anybody think that's going to work? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, and he goes, oh, like, what does work? And then I explain the fiscal side. 
where when you spend more than you tax, that is a direct add of, you know, uh, income and net financial assets. And when you increase deficit spending proactively, any economist who pays to be right is going to revise his forecast upward for the economy. Okay. So again, just to, I'll, I'll recapitulate the argument so you understand where he's coming from, and then I'm going to start trying to unpack it and explain why I think it's misleading or, or just wrong to use a, to use a word. Okay, so Moser's saying, look at at any given time, you know, there's creditors and debtors, and so if the Fed raises interest rates, what does that mean? Oh, the people who owed money to the creditors, you know, now they have to pay more. And so if we're talking about debt, you know, creditors and debtors who are both within the private sector, in terms of the aggregate private sector, it's just a wash, right? That raising or lowering interest rates doesn't affect um, you know, aggregate income flows and things like that because it's just, you know, one person now has to pay more to the other. So yeah, the other person, you know, has more. But the person who has to pay more, you know, has less. So it's just kind of like a redistribution in that sense, you know, relative to the counterfactual of if, if interest rates had stayed the same. But he's saying it's not a wash when you consider the fact that the government sector is involved. Okay, because now suppose that amongst the creditors are not just people who are owed money from other people or institutions in the private sector, but are owed money from the federal government, right? So the people or institutions that hold treasury securities. And he's saying, so now when the Fed raises interest rates, the holders of the treasury security, their income goes up, right? That's obvious. And with this stuff, by the way, in case you're wondering, they don't get to it in this interview, but Mosler elsewhere, when he was talking to a guy that was more wonkish, I think I even went through that on this Human Action uh, podcast. This was like in this, I think it was the summer of 2023 when that when that episode dropped. Um, but Mosler gets into the you know the details and saying yes, with a lot of this stuff, it's it's like when the debt rolls over. Okay, in case you're getting hung up on that technicality. So, so you're not wrong that when we were speaking loosely about, oh, the Fed raises rates, and so now the people who hold government debt have a higher flow of income, you might be thinking, well, no, if I'm sitting on a 10-year treasury clipping coupons, my coupons don't go up just because the Fed changed interest rates. That just, you know, I have a capital loss on my, um, on the, you know, the, the market value of my bond. And then, so, you know, the same flow of cash is now a higher yield, you know, yield, yield to maturity. Okay. But Mosler's abstracted from that complication. He's saying as the debt is rolled over, it goes, you know, as it goes into higher, you know, market rates, then the flow of interest payments that the federal government is making to people in the private sector goes up. All right. And then Mosler again is saying, that's not a wash. Right. Whereas before, if we're talking about, oh, yeah, people have you know, credit card debt. And up, if interest rates go up, hey, that, that, does that prop up demand? Because now the credit card companies are getting a higher volume of interest payments, you know, finance charges, if you want to call it that. Well, no, because the consumers who are paying those rates, you know, now have left, less to spend. And so that's just kind of rearranging the wealth in, in, among members of the private sector. But if we're now talking about the feds paying more two people in the private sector. Well, there you go. Now that's net income to them. Okay. So that's the argument. So I've got two problems with that. So one thing is, and I have not heard, maybe he did get into it in the previous discussion. Like I said, it happened more than a year ago, well, about a year ago in the more wonkish one here. I don't think they got into it at all, but strictly speaking, just to say, oh, because interest rates went up, and then even accounting for the fact that the Fed has to, the, the government, excuse me, the Federal Reserve or the Treasury has to roll over its outstanding debt, um, it doesn't automatically follow that the deficit gets higher, which is implicitly, 
you know, what, what Mosler is talking about. Okay, so what if, so, so yes, let's suppose because the Fed raises rates a certain amount, let's suppose that translates into for the, you know, the next 12 months that the Treasury has to pay $500 billion more in interest payments than it otherwise would have had to do. Okay. That doesn't mean the deficit is therefore $500 billion higher because maybe since the interest expense went up, the Treasury spends less on other things. You know, maybe they postpone a aid to Ukraine or something. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's a basic point, but I'm just pointing that out, right? It, it's not just a given. It's not, it's not a law of accounting that because an institution's interest expense goes up a certain amount that everything else has to stay the same. And that, oh, the way we're going to make that up is just by the federal government borrowing that much more and going that much more deeply into debt. That, that, that doesn't follow at all. It could cut its spending elsewhere, right? So I'm just going to make that point. Just like, you know, if, oh, wow, if the, uh, if the price of steel that they use in fighter jets goes up, you don't just automatically say, so, so that now the deficit is that much higher. Like, well, no, maybe if that project is more expensive than they originally thought, then you know they, they spend less on other things. Okay, so I'm just, again, making the point that that's a, a critical link in Mosler's argument that I didn't see anybody mention. So I make that point. And, and what that has to do with is, is the idea that really all Mosler's is, is getting at is that, oh, when the interest rate goes up, the Fed's going to create more money and that, you know, that's ultimately what's fueling, you know, the extra income flow in the economy from an MMT perspective. Okay. And so here is now, I think the, the more fundamental problem I have with this whole argument is that like when, when Mosler says, take the federal government or assume the federal government has zero debt, Right. And like this, you know, if we start analyzing it right after Andrew Jackson pays off the debt, um, and they say, "Oh, what if?" The, well, the central bank can't raise the interest rates when Andrew Jackson pays off the debt because Andrew Jackson also got rid of the Second Bank of the United States. But go with me on this one: if the government had no debt, so that's not an issue, and then Mosler was acting as if, "Oh, these are just, you know, things that offset each other," as interest rates go up people in the private sector who are debtors pay more to people in the private sector who are creditors, but that's just, you know, offsetting movements. The private sector as a whole doesn't have more wealth or total income, net net income that way. You're missing something because when we just say, oh, what if the Fed raises or lowers interest rates? It doesn't just magically wave a wand and do that. It doesn't just turn a dial the way in practice the Fed does that, I mean, it has several tools at this point, but a standard method is by buying and selling assets. Okay. And so, and like I say, in this cycle with the uh, tightening that the Fed has engaged in, it has been sucking money out of the system. Right. And so, I mean, uh, it, it, whatever metric you want to look at. You, you can see that, so it's even spilled over into higher, you know, monetary aggregates, like M2 and so forth, right? So we'll flash this up on the screen just to show you what I'm talking about. So what I want to show you is, as the Fed has tightened, right? So as the Federal Reserve or the Federal Funds Rate has gone up, and as the Fed's balance sheet has come down, consumer price inflation, you know, year-over-year -year growth has also come down, okay? And so... You know, I, I don't, there's this notion that the MMT people are running victory laps saying, aha, people said that hiking interest rates would bring down inflation, but it hasn't. And yes, it has, right? <laughs> I mean, the Biden White House is, is congratulating itself too much, but yes, the annual rate of the increase in the CPI has come down from where it was. And that happened as the Fed was tightening. And as the critics were saying, don't tighten too much because you might tip us into recession. And now, since we didn't get into a recession, they're all saying, oh, see, we told you it was transitory. I mean, it's just, it's Orwellian. But anyway, here, we'll, we'll flash it. I promise you would. <laughs> we're going to do it. We'll flash it up on the screen. This chart showing the combination of the various factors I've just talked about. And again, what I want you to see is that 
as the Fed's uh, or as the Federal Reserve raised interest rates and allowed its balance sheet to start shrinking, and you saw a turnaround in like the M2 money stock, the level of it. I'm not just talking about the slowing in the growth. Though M2 actually has come down, you can see that the year over year change in the CPI also greatly moderated. Okay, so again, what else would the charts have to look like for people to think raising rates cooled off price inflation, which is what this you know standard textbook story is? So again, it's Mosler is trying to give like, hey, there's this weird phenomenon out there that nobody else can explain. I can with my wacky MMT, and I'm saying no, the the conventional textbooks are right on this. That this is what you would have expected to see is the Fed tightened. Consumer price inflation slowed way down. That's, you know, there's no mystery there. Okay. And so just more generally, when we say the Federal Reserve is going to hike rates or or cut rates, typically that is like the accounting flip side of buying assets or selling assets, or actually selling assets or buying assets in terms of the way I said that, which, you know, makes reserves come or go into the system. Okay, so the you know the big picture is to just say, oh, if if they raise rates and we're just looking at private sector players, then yep, the debtors are now paying more to the creditors, but there's not a net increase. Well, the, there's actually a decrease, right? Because the way the Fed raises rates typically is by sucking money out of the system and destroying it. Right, that the Fed sells off assets, which sucks dollars out of the system and puts it into the Fed's hands. And since the Fed, you know, since 1971, isn't constrained by gold redeemability, when when you electronically send payments to the Fed, that money just disappears. Just like on the flip side, if the Fed buys assets and writes checks electronically and deposits in people's accounts, that's new money into the system. They create money out of thin air, as it were. Okay, so again, it's it's just a bit too glib when Mosler is saying, "Oh yeah, if the Fed raises or lowers rates among private sector creditor and debtors, it, that has that's just a wash." That's not true because the way that the Fed raises or lowers rates does affect the total quantity of money. Okay, and so it's it, it's not just purely a wash. Okay. Also, I'll be quick on this one because I've made this point many times, but notice. You know, Mosler has this popular MMT refrain that government budget deficits on net or add net assets, net financial assets to the economy. So I'll, I'll just repeat my quick critique of that. First, what, what is he saying? What's the logic behind that? You know, he's not, he's not a crazy man. He's not lying. Like he thinks, you know, he earnestly believes in what he's saying. So where's he coming from? Because... Normally, the way most text, you know, economics or for finance books deal with this stuff, they would say in the private sector, net financial assets always sum to zero. Okay, a financial asset meaning not like a real asset, not like farmland or equipment in a factory, but like shares of stock in a corporation or bonds issued by a corporation. Those are financial assets. Okay, and they're the typical claim is usually the way this the accounting is done is to say in the in a closed system net financial assets sum to zero because if a corporation you know issues bonds yep the pension fund that's sitting on those bonds views those things as net as as assets right but the corporation views its outstanding bonds as liabilities and so on net between the two entities they cancel out Right, so if it's, basically, if if A owes B money, it's not that A and B put together have net assets. That's the idea. It's, it's as simple as that. Okay, and then they're going to say, but hang on, what if the government, which stands outside the private sector, owes money to people in the private sector, namely because they're holding government bonds? Well, now those are net financial assets to the private sector because they're owed money. And that's not offset by liabilities within the system. They're owed money from outside the system, and hence it's a net asset within the system, right? That's the idea. And that's why the MMT people think that government budget deficits 
you know, boost growth and they make the economy wealthier or the private sector feel wealthier and people are willing to spend more and so on. And that also they're going to say that's why when the government foolishly runs a string of budget surpluses, they're destroying net private financial assets. And that's why we see all of the big economic crashes in U.S. history were preceded by budget surpluses, right? Like in the 1920s, Calvin Coolidge was doing a good job paying down the federal debt, and then the 29 crash. Bill Clinton, if you didn't know this, was actually running official budget surpluses in the late 90s, and then we had the dot-com crash. Okay, where they their story doesn't work is <laughs> there weren't budget surpluses leading into the 2008 crisis, and even there they get into like the next derivative. And well, the 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 size of the deficit was shrinking, even though it technically didn't go, flip. Okay, so that's where they're coming from. So what's wrong with that? Maybe, again, I'll do this quickly because I've done this a lot before. So one thing is there's nothing special about the government in that in terms of the accounting there, right? You could just as easily draw a circle around a company and just divide the world into, you know, that company and the rest of the world. And then it would be true to say, you know, so let, let's say it's uh, Google that unless Google issues new bonds, the rest of the world, you know, the, the, the world minus Google can't accumulate net financial assets. That's also true. And I could just run around talking about how Google's financing operations affect the ability of the rest of the world to get ahead, right? And I could, you know, if I was challenged, I could show you the math and show you the accounting tautologies and say, no, this is this is just numbers, man. It's just math. Don't don't, don't get mad at me. Just math. And you could, you know, when you think that through, you could say, okay, yes, I guess that's true, but so what, right? It's it doesn't at all constrain the economic activity of the rest of the world for me to point out the true statement that the world minus Google can only accumulate net financial assets if Google goes deeper into debt. And yeah, that's a true statement, but that has no significance. And so I'm saying in terms of just the accounting, it also doesn't do anything for me to tell me the private, the, in the United States, you know, excluding the foreign markets, the private sector can only get net financial assets if the U.S. federal government goes deeper into debt. So what? I don't care in terms of the accounting, right? And not, now the MMT people can come back and say, oh, well, see, there's differences because the, the federal government with the Fed has a printing press, whereas Google doesn't. And, it, and then I, you know, so now we're getting more into economics and I'd say, okay, right. And so the fact that they can print green pieces of paper or just create electronic entries doesn't create wealth. And in fact, that's why I would rather it be Google and, you know, <laughs> not be able to create, quote, net assets by just issuing it out of thin air and acquiring real resources that way. That, that's not a good system, right? So I'm saying, but they don't rely on that when they just do their accounting tautologies. And so there I can do the same thing with Google. And again, then they get pushed into, okay, they're bringing some economics into it and say, well, there's other differences. And it's because the, and then I bring in my economics and say, no, printing money doesn't make you wealthier. Okay. So there's, there's that element. Also too, just real quickly, um, there's something odd about the way the MMT camp does it where, okay, what am I trying to say? Yes, the the private sector acquiring net financial assets from the government or, or acquiring financial assets, I should say. Okay, sure. And then they say, ah, and the liability rests with the government. But there's a very important sense. And we say, well, how is the government going to pay that debt or at least service the interest cost? from the private sector, right? It's not that the federal government, I mean, what, what could work is that the federal government were going to pay off the, the bondholders by giving them, you know, the offshore mineral deposits and stuff that's on federal land and other, or, you know, the gold that may or may not be in the uh, New York Fed's vaults and so forth and at Fort Knox. Okay, that could make sense. And then I, and then I would say, even as an Austrian, yes, it does make the private sector wealthier if the federal government right now takes resources that, according to our legal system, are owned by the federal government, like you know crude oil in the salt mines and or in the in the salt caves and whatever, and 
hands it over to people in the private sector and said, this is now legally your property. That that transfer would make the private sector wealthier. There's nothing magical about that. It's just the federal, you know, federal government own, owns a bunch of real estate. It owns a bunch of buildings, office buildings and such. And if it transferred title to that over to people in the private sector, that would make the private sector wealthier. I don't disagree with that. But that's not what the MMT people mean. They mean the government through either inflation or taxation or borrowing, again, can make those interest payments. And that's where how they're coming up with the funds to pay. And so, no, I mean, obviously with taxation, that's just, you know, taking money from you to get right back to you. So that doesn't count. And then by printing money, again, we're just back to, is it really making Americans a trillion dollars wealthier if the government creates a trillion dollars in cash and hands it out? There's a sense in which yes, and there's a sense in which no. And I'm saying the MMT uh, view rests entirely on the interpretation of saying, yep, if the Federal Reserve created a trillion dollars in $100 bills and just handed it out to Americans, Americans are a trillion dollars wealthier in terms of the accounting. And okay, I mean, that, that but that's, I think everybody kind of knew that, right? <laughs> the, the sense in which that's true, there was no mystery, right? Murray Rothbard knew that. Adam Smith probably knew that. Okay, so that's that's the deep, profound insights of MMT. Okay, let me now just jump ahead. Let me play one more clip for you, then we'll wrap it up here. Right now, the, the deficit's 7% of GDP, 4% of which is interest expense. So without the interest expense, if they had left rates at zero, it would have been trending towards zero, and the deficit would have been down at, you know, 2 3 4%, something still high, but not like it is now. And that, to me, is like, it's, it's unthinkable that that's not going to support a strong economy. Now, what's interesting is in the last month, we've there's been a little bit of a bump in the numbers, right? Uh, the Fed Atlanta is down to 1.7% GDP growth, still not a recession or anything. And everybody's look, now looking for this collapse and Fed rate cuts and everything else. And I'm sitting here going, how, how can this be with a 7% pro-cyclical budget deficit? It doesn't. It seems like an absurd assumption that we could have any kind of substantial weakness. Okay, so there again, Mosler is arguing that you know how could we go, be tipping into a recession right now, right? Because again, the conventional wisdom is there should have been a recession. You know, and I'm guilty of this too. I have thought for a while with the inverted yield curve and with you know the, which was going hand in hand with the Fed rate hikes that we were entering a recession because I thought there was very loose monetary policy after or during and after COVID and then a standard Austrian business cycle theory that, you know, uh, mon loose money builds up an unsustainable bubble that then crashes. And so Mosler is saying right now with that interest channel of income coming through the def the budget deficit is like 7% of GDP. How could we possibly have a weak economy given that the budget deficit is that big? Okay, so here it's a little bit, I, what I wanted to do is like sort of a counterexample, which is go through and show that in U.S. history, you know, there we have had bad economies with a large budget deficit. Okay, so here we can look at the, at the chart. So the problem is that if you can, if you can see here, very rarely is the budget deficit ever 7% of gross domestic product. All right, really the only times that has happened uh, are, you know, during the Great Depression. and Well, not even the Great Depression, actually, now, as I'm looking at this more, it's, it was World War II that did it. And then um, right after the financial crisis of 2008, there was a period there, a stretch where the budget deficit was, was lower than, or, you know, in negative terms, was was more than seven percent, and then going in, you know, immediate aftermath of COVID. Okay, so it's it's hard to to point to that. So there's a sense in which we can't dismiss what Mosler is saying simply because, yeah, this is this is so unusual. But what, what the chart also does show us is there's plenty of times when the government has been running a budget deficit, and then the economy went into recession. All right, so it's it's you know, there there are other occasions too where there was a surplus, like I said, you know, famously, um, 
you know, under the in the twenties under the Coolidge administration, and then uh, under the Bill Clinton administration, and going right up into two thousand, there there was surplus. But in general, it's not the case that oh yeah, the economy always you know goes into surplus, and then there's a, there's a, a big crash, and vice versa. It's also not the case. For example, uh, in the late eighties, that. I'll just play, give you some specific numbers here. So in 1989, the budget deficit was about 2.7% of GDP. And then in 1990, it was 3.7% of GDP. And then in 91, we were officially in a, in a recession. Okay, so there, you know, there was a full year of the deficit getting worse before then in the following year, you know, you, we were officially in a recession. So in Moser's framework, that's kind of hard to explain, all right? Or going the other way, whatever method he uses to explain that, like by saying, oh, yes, the deficit was increasing, but not enough or something. And that's why, okay, but again, I mean, that's like a standard Keynesian trick that, oh, yes, the Obama stimulus package was good. It just wasn't big enough. And that's why unemployment kept going up, okay? So what I'm saying is Moser would lead you to believe that so long as there's a robust budget deficit, you can't fall into recession. And I'm I'm saying no, that's that's not true. That um, there have been plenty of cases in U.S. history where even when the deficit was getting worse, well before the recession officially began. Right? And w- last thing I'll say here, with a lot of this stuff, it's tricky because you could say, well, yeah, there was a bad recession, or sorry, there was there was a, a huge budget deficit, like I said, you know, after the financial crisis, and so couldn't I point to that and say, see, Warren. Big budget deficit, horrible economy, you know, explain this. And then he could say, well, it's because of the timing, right? Like, given that you're having an awful economy, the budget deficit at that moment might be really big because, you know, tax revenues are way down and standard, you know, income support payments and stuff kick up and re- relief and whatever. And so you have a big budget deficit. But it would it'd be like saying, wow, a lot of people, you know, hospitals are really dangerous because, you know, you know, if so many people die in hospitals, you should st- steer clear. And by itself, without knowing more about medicine or whatever, that that would be an unfair criticism. And so, you know, likewise, just because there's big budget deficits when the economy's bad doesn't prove large budget deficits hurt economic growth. But still, uh, you know, you can say, well, what, what would the world need to look like for Warren to be wrong? And I'm saying if you have, you know, the economy's clearly in budget deficit the whole time. And the budget deficit is getting worse over a stretch of years. And then it keeps the budget deficit keeps getting bigger. And then the economy goes into recession. Like, shouldn't that kind of blow up the idea that a big budget deficit, you know, provides the fuel to keep the economy afloat? So with all this stuff, I guess we'll we'll see. You know, according to Mosler, we should have smooth sailing with the economy. He said, you know, unless there's like some external shock, like suitcase nuke goes off in Iran or something and the oil prices shoot up to $150 a barrel. But barring that, Moser thinks, yeah, there's nothing in the system that would cause the economy to slow down. Whereas that's that's certainly not what I've been saying. Okay, well, I will wrap it up there. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.